My name is Doug Midori. I'm the Director of Internet Analysis for Kentic, and my, my talk here is entitled Parsing BGB Tables for Fun and Profit, which is how I introduce our new product uh, from this year, Kentic Market Intelligence. It could also be the title for my career for the past 13 years, going from uh, an analyst at Renesis uh, onto Dyn Research to Oracle, and now, as a couple of years ago, uh, over to Kentic. So here I'm going to talk about uh, KMI, is how we refer to this, this tool. So KMI, what is it? It is a, a SaaS business intelligence tool for understanding AS transit peering relationships uh, for any market in the world. Um, I submit to you there's a lot of hidden insights hidden in the routing uh, global routing table uh, that can be used for a bunch of different business functions. And uh, we uh, feel like we've got use cases for uh, marketing, uh, sales, and then network planning, network architecture, network uh, peering coordinator, that kind of uh, role in the last category there. So before I get into using the product, let me just help us understand how it works. Magic. So. What we start with, this is, a, this is a tool that's almost entirely based on BGP data alone. Uh, it is annotated with uh, geolocation, um, uh, labels, those kind of things, but otherwise the core data, there's no, there's no just like BGP, there's no sense of performance, that kind of thing, uh, baked into this. Uh, at the moment, right now, we're just pulling down route views uh, ribs, um, or refreshing this tool every six hours. So this is not like an operational tool that you would troubleshoot something that took place Five minutes ago. This is a bit more for um, yeah, strategic uh, use cases. Uh, Kentic has a lot of BGP data uh, that it gets through uh, its relationships with its customers and has thousands of, of sessions. And we're in the process of pulling some of that data over and populating uh, more of this, this product. And we'll see we'll see mostly a lot of um, a lot more fidelity and uh, peering relationships. Uh, those are things that are typically hidden. Um, transit is usually um, uh, fairly easy to catch. And then, um, you know, an upside of this, uh, unlike some of the other uh, Kentic uh, offerings where it's kind of invasive, you've got to send uh, NetFlow for this thing to uh, get going. You can log in, you can start clicking around and deciding, you know, uh, what you think of uh, what we've got here. All right, so here's how it works. Uh, so. We pull in, again, every six hours, uh, a whole lot of uh, BGP data. So route views is 300 or so plus full tables. Each table, uh, these the V4, we're talking about a, uh, approaching a million routes. So 300 million of these lines of a prefix and an AS path. So between every AS uh, adjacency, this is a business relationship that we're trying to classify. Um, and we have a, uh, uh, somewhat sophisticated classifying uh, classifier. I use a, a Bayesian uh, logic. Uh, it has a few things that can use uh, properties such as valley free, um, to, uh, and we'll explain that a little bit. You guys probably have heard of that. We can proceed that with a set of uh, commonly understood uh, DFCs. These are ASs that don't buy uh, transit. You know, even if we miss one there, uh, the, the system figures it out anyway, so it's uh, we don't have to be 100% um, on that. But essentially, virtually all uh, relationships get classified as either uh, transit or peering. And when we say peering in this context, we're referring to settlement-free peering. So in BGP, almost every term is overloaded uh, of multiple meanings. Uh, sometimes a peer is a, just simply an adjacency. In this case, when we say peer, we're talking about a, a settlement-free peer. And then transit. Sorry, uh, yes. when, when you mentioned that the system figures it out on its own when defining if it's a transit, if it's a, a DFC, provider then is it is it because of the traffic flows or how does it know let's assume you just didn't put it because it i don't know you forgot or whatever it's not registered and uh, in in your database for some reason just get to the worst case scenario then how does the system figure it out um yeah so this is the the classification of transit so um again if you if you see uh uh this um, classifier with DFC. So let's say uh, 3356, uh, if there's an adjacency, it's either gonna be a, uh, a peer or a, uh, a customer. Since we're already saying this isn't gonna be a, a transit provider, there's gonna be a transit provider for that AS, then um, everything onto that side of that AS is going to be descending transit relationships. In fact, if, we're, if one of those uh, ASs exists, 
the, the only time a, a peer uh, a peer relationship could could exist would be another uh, DFC. Everything else has to be um, uh, transit uh, on going on down. Um, that's that's how that logic works. I don't know if that makes sense. So if you were to pull any any uh, AS path, um, yeah, if you got if you got lucky and uh, and you saw a um, um, a DFC AS, it's it's kind of it's an, an easy case. It gets harder when they're not there, and so now you're using the edges that you classified when they were there uh, to help you uh, uh, determine which are transit and which are um, uh, which are yeah, the default free zone. Default free zone. Yeah, it's also TFZ. I don't know what's the better. Okay. Uh, free zone. Okay, just deacronymizing. Yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of other heuristics. So, for example, uh, if you are getting a transit, if you're getting global transit from another AS, then if you if I have you know 300 vantage points, a lot of them uh, should be many can see this as a, a, a AS that is upstream of you. Um, if it's for peering. You're going to greatly reduce how many uh, vantage points are able to see that just by the nature of how, how it works. Uh, you know, that's a kind of a, a yeah. course mechanism, but that's one of about 15 inputs we can we can use. In Let me just make another statement. Sure. We're sure. talking about BGP peering and not whether someone's paying for it and whether it's peering or transit in that sense, because we don't see the economics of this. Even though some of this stuff, it's like Game of Thrones, it is known. Um, this is really just the things you can observe from the BGP data uh, side. So, yeah, so that's a good point. So then you can have cases where these things diverge. So there's, uh, uh, I'll say that a few years ago there was a big European incumbent uh, that was able to strong arm Google into playing them, and they made a bit a lot of hay out of this. Uh, when they uh, look at themselves in this tool, they want to see these guys listed as a as a um, uh, Google as a, a customer because they're getting money. And that's not something we're going to see. We're never going to see any of the financial arrangements. So if it looks uh, by our model in BGP as a, uh, a settlement free peer, we don't use settlement free peer. We're just talking about peering. We're going to call it a peer because um, that's essentially what it is. They don't provide service to any other part of the world. Uh, it's just their own captive audience. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's a it's an area of, uh, of academic study as well, and, um, and I could go for hours uh, on that. But why don't we keep moving? So, how do you deal uh, with the data sources you're getting? You mentioned route views, uh, which is an awesome source. Uh, however, since it is community provided data, there are often all sorts of interesting views of the world you can get where an IX might add their ASN in weird ways or strip out ASNs in weird ways, or, you know, maybe somebody leaks routes uh, to their route view collector. Um, I, I've seen this personally with some of the BGP analysis tools that we have in house. How do you deal with that in the KMI tool? Yeah, <laughs> and pre-pending the hell out of stuff. Well, right. pre-pending, I mean, let's say pre-pending uh, just because you brought it up. It's not an issue, right? Like a pre-pending, what you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're trying to do traffic engineering. You're trying to shift uh, who's gonna select something. It's not really gonna cause a problem unless you've, yeah, unless it pre-pending is not gonna um, take a, an adjacency and make it not a, not appear. Uh, it'll still, it'll still show up. Um, in fact, you know, uh, I did a talk at uh, Nanog and Wright a couple years ago about how uh, overly used uh, this uh, you know, pre-pending uh, is and. Um, Anyway, so that one, I, I haven't encountered a, an issue with that one. Um, let's see. So route leaks uh, are typically, um, so if it's an ephemeral one, somebody's barfed something out, and uh, uh, we, you know, let's say we're, we're taking ribs at a certain time. Uh, if that leak happened to still be in circulation at that time, uh, uh, we still shouldn't be affected by that because what we're doing is any of these um, any new transit relationship had to have been seen for a couple of, uh, uh, I think it's three um, uh, six hour periods. Uh, so there is a little bit of um, uh, safeguarding there so that we don't get thrown off by some big big barf that just happens to have a, happen on the, our six hour boundary. Um, there, uh, conversely on persistent leaks, uh, then yes, uh, this will show up. Um, and it's, it's actually been a way that I've had customers in the past so I've had similar capabilities in the past of actually identifying these where uh, a uh, someone who's a uh, someone on the network architecture time. This is not I'm not a sales guy or a uh, marketing guy is going to find this, but one of the uh, peering coordinator or something was going to look themselves up. 
and say like, hey, what you've re you've misclassified one of our uh, our settlement free peers as a transit provider. Um, sometimes they're nice and they're like, uh, could you look into it? Sometimes they're like, you need to fix this yesterday. Um, and I was like, all right, let's look at the data. Let's figure out what's going on here. And uh, I'd say like nine times out of 10, there's some kind of screw up that's happening that's causing our classifier to make that conclusion. And usually it's the other guy now is leaking uh, routes out and then uh, this is how they've discovered it. And it's some very low level, but persistent uh, leak. It will show up, um, but that's actually, you know, uh, I would argue it's a good thing. And um, it's how sometimes these things get discovered. Does that answer your question about uh, leaks? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so there are still, you can still have a thing. I know that in the past, uh, doing route collection kind of work, uh, we would get stuff where um, uh, we get a, a, a peering session that was using a route optimizer. I don't think Noxion, it was another one that would just reorganize. <laughs> you kind of, it would like, I don't know if it would sort uh, numerically or it would reorganize the ASs. So almost all the AS adjacencies coming out of that were, uh, um, uh, were made up, were not real. And uh, that's a, that is problematic, and so we get polluted uh, by that. And so then, um, at least uh, when it's that drastic of an event, then the pollution starts showing up uh, everywhere. And um, I, I don't know I haven't encountered that in many years, but uh, we have had that many years ago. Where um, I'm looking at all these data, it's like this is amazing. This is amazing. This is like some uh, incredible things are taking place, or the data is completely ruined. Um, well, with the AS seven thousand seven incident, which you can watch on Outlook Talk to hear about if you don't remember it when uh bgp went to rip v1 and back to bgp through two blades of a well fleet router um then everything became that was class full became class less which effectively was was making everything that was a uh you know more uh, that was more that wasn't an, a uh a, a class a or b became a slash 24 and originated from as 7007 so you do have to you do have some Dirty data that technically, you know, is correct, but isn't actually helpful to see during these massive leak outages. So, make the comment, Doug, that you could probably get a good idea about the competency level of for ASNs and how much filtration or lack thereof they do uh, in terms of accepting prefixes from their peers or downstreams. Um. Yeah, I guess it would be hard to know if an AS. Um... Who's who's doing the filtering? If uh, if it wasn't if it wasn't um, you know exported to them, uh, it'll say that a custom like somebody has two upstreams. Uh, we only see a prefix going through one. Is that because they only exported the one, or, and or is it the other one that's filtering it? Um, uh, you have to have an ounce of humility in, in some of this, where you just uh, sometimes there's no way to know. There's only so far you can go with the data on that, but. Um, yeah, so then uh, ASs that appear in AS, pa sorry, IXP ASs that appear in uh, AS paths, uh, that I don't see very much anymore. In fact, that's really gone away. When I was first doing this in 2009, it was uh, more prevalent. You'd see like 12, uh, 1200 or something for AM6. And now this is done without putting the AS in the path, which actually makes things easier. But there are some, a few corner cases and you always end up with a few that uh, the classifier kind of barfs on and then a couple of humans look at it and we're like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what they're trying to do here. Uh, and uh, sometimes that's because it's somebody's messed up. And then sometimes someone is intentionally trying to do something super funky. Um, but um, honestly, by the numbers, it's just, it's not even noise. It's, it doesn't, uh, the vast majority of stuff is, is actually fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so yeah, we uh, imagine it's a value free thing. So the, the idea is that nobody's doing anything for free on the internet, which you know, if it's a business, uh, you're either getting, you're exchanging traffic or you're getting traffic for money. Um, and so like a hypothetical uh, AS path, AS one, two, three, and four, uh, it's one possible classification. It, it could be a, a few different ones. You're ascending on the edges. Uh, there's often appearing link uh, to somewhere in the middle. Um, you cannot have these uh, uh, valleys in that where like in the one in the middle at the bottom. Uh, AS2 is essentially paying AS1 and AS3 to help them exchange their traffic. That's a losing proposition. Uh, there's nothing inherent in BGP that prevents uh, this from happening. It's just uh, a, 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 network, a network engineer uh, uh, does not want this to happen because they're they're paying other people for their own, uh, moving their own traffic. So let's see. So that's the AS path side, the AS uh, relationship classification. And again, um, ha happy to 
talk more at length on that uh, afterwards. Um, it is a, it can get a fairly deep uh, topic. Um, on the other side, of just the prefixes. So we assign each prefix a geolocation, um, and uh, and then we have a uh, we assign it a score uh, based on uh, based on the size, and it has it's kind of a decaying uh, 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 score that tries to prevent the really large prefixes from just dominating things because since you know um, things like flash eights are really are, are used more as placeholders than as uh, prefixes that really drive uh, traffic from point A to point B so we want to make sure that they uh, they don't get to they don't dominate this because it's really the good stuff the good stuff is the slash 24s 22 uh, 3s 22s uh, that's where uh, that's where it gets interesting um, and obviously we have a, a v6 equivalent to all of this um, Let's see, so as a prefix uh, is, is transiting through the uh, internet, that score that we assigned uh, for that geo gets uh, applied to each AS until it's no longer ascending transit. Um, and, and so then we kind of sum across all the prefixes for all these different geos. Um, and then uh, that's how the, the scores uh, are, are built. And that's how we end up doing things like ranking uh, stuff. Obviously there's, it's a model. Uh, so we have no actual traffic uh, data uh, in here, um, and another another weakness. There's a, there's a conceit that you know uh, a lot more address space means a lot more traffic. Obviously, that uh, isn't always the case. The biggest example of that is uh, content providers. So Google, you know, compared to some of these guys who have large customer cones, doesn't have that much address space, but pushes a ton of traffic. Uh, so content providers are not going to uh, fare well. Uh, in this methodology, it's really about trying to understand uh, the transit uh, architecture of, of, of the internet and be able to pull up country X, understand who's buying from who, how does that change from day to day, and how do I get alerted on uh, those changes? Let's see. So, how do you, there's Drake and somebody else. Uh, let's see. So, so I mentioned these use cases, and we'll, we'll uh, run through a quick demo here. But, um, for those of you guys who've been around for a while, maybe you've uh, uh, remember like the Baker's Dozen blogs. Uh, it was that this kind of approach that was the, the basis for those kind of things. Again, fodder for debate uh, as far as like you know, who's who's number one. But it, um, uh, in our neck, neck of the woods, uh, people like to have reasons to uh, to debate these things. Uh, so let's see. So we do these rankings again uh, mentioned earlier. This is strictly based on uh, scored transited IP space. Um, and, uh, and so marketing uh, companies, uh, marketing teams at, at various telecoms really appreciate this. Uh, they like to see where they show up well. We have a lot of subcategories, uh, so often uh, a decent sized network is gonna be number one in something. Um, so everybody grew out of some kind of home turf. Uh, and that home turf, uh, maybe they've since uh, moved on to do other things, but they still uh, probably look pretty good in their uh, home market. Hey Doug, Chris Cummings uh, here. Uh, yeah, I'm curious if I'm curious if uh, KMI pulls in from the other uh, Kintic aggregation stuff to to kind of lump uh, some of these various ASNs into larger organizational entities. For example, I see Lumen on here twice, right, for the CenturyLink ASN versus the Level Three ASN, and probably the Quest ASN is on there somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> down, see. down, down through history. Definitely. Uh, let's see. We 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 don't. I, mean, I guess we've had some discussion around that. I mean. Uh, what ends up happening is the um, these these networks are still uh, in routing. They're still independent entities, um, and then, so what ends up happening is uh, for Lumen in particular, since they're a, a pretty big example of this, you've got a couple of you know two hundred nine three uh, uh, three five six um, is the it's the top of the heap, but then you know the old global crossing thirty five forty nine. Those twenty two hundred nine and thirty five forty nine are essentially configured as transit customers to three three five six. If you were to look, you would see uh, routes that come from those go to three three five six and on to let's say uh, Telia or NTT or something. There's a there's a, a, a TFC DFC peering link. Um, so the score of that other customer actually uh, that one of those subsidiaries. Actually flows up to the uh, uh, the overarching um, AS. Uh, so as far as the rankings go, we feel like it's it's okay. Um, as far as like trying to merge them together, I don't know they would gain a lot. Um, it's it's a bit already cooked in. 
The same thing goes for Verizon. So they've got like 701, 702, 703 as far as like their regional global uh, areas. But if you look, 201 and two, sorry, 702 and 703 are essentially configured as uh, transit customers of 701, which then sends those on to the peering links. Um, so it ends up, ends up being 702 and 703, the, tra the score ends up flows up to 701. So if you want a global view, you take 701 and look at the global view. Um, uh, I don't know, I'm not too concerned about it. I am kind of always, uh, it's kind of fun to look at how things like 3549 and now maybe it's going to get spun off as its own company. So maybe it was best that they never di fully digested this thing, but we'd see independent routing um, that's different than uh, 3356 uh, three, uh, over the years. And um, uh, and so we're like, we're going to treat that as different until it really is completely uh, digested. Uh, it, it never happened and now it never will, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that what makes that hard is, of course, you know, if you if you did want to make that global merger and change, you'd have to touch all of those customers to all of those sub down down. Yeah, channel, there are implications. A really be, big job. It'll be, it could get kind of uh, unwieldy. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm rationalizing. Uh, <laughs> rationalizing. I think, I think, I think, think it's that, fine. I think it's fine. engineer said, "Go to hell! <laughs> I ain't doing that." I was like. I, I got to come up with a good reason of why I don't want to do all this work. Uh, let me think here. So, um, no, um, I, uh, in, I, in a in another enhancement area here, I mean, this is all prefix based. Are you looking at a way to get that flow information and magic you have in other areas yeah. to convert this to actual traffic, or That's or right, at least yes. rough estimations of yep. traffic? Uh, so let's see. We have a lot of discussions around that. When we started talking about this capability, we're like, all right, well, let's just. Let's just make sure we match all this workflow that was recently lost and make sure we're covering people who uh, there's a, as, as I'm going through these use cases, there's actually people whose jobs it is to uh, use tools like this. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we have a few things we're pretty good at at Kentic and one is NetFlow and this doesn't have any NetFlow in it as of today. Uh, but you can imagine it wouldn't be a very hard to make a pivot here and say like, all right, fine. Uh, based on this model, this is the ranking that we've got based on this, uh, the, the um, well, one of the described. sensitivities there is BGP is more deterministic data. Even if you have to infer what the AS relationships are, the input data is deterministic. Because we have so many service provider customers, for Kentic to start doing a service provider performance ranking, especially that's public, gets a little bit awkward. But within the product, we definitely intend to do more with combining the BGP insights the other side of BGP, which we're not showing you know, here, which is hijacking and what's the activity of BGP from an operational perspective, the performance tests we're doing and the flow to bring all that together is absolutely you know, pieces that we're gonna do. So right now you can go to what Steve showed CDN, you can go over and say, start testing the CDN, but putting that all in one page and you know, integrating it even better. Those are certainly directions that we're headed. So I would just add to one thing that Avi uh, was uh, a saying here is like so. Let's say you are uh, you are a Kentic customer. You're sending us for flow. Uh, you've got that analyzed every which way. Now you've got this capability. Um, we'd like to add a little uh, feature here, just to pivot. You know, to go back and say like, all right, well, this is you know, this is the the, the top for North America. <clears throat> I'd like to see how how would how does how would I rank my net flow to these ASs? Would it, it probably would be different. And so that kind of already exists in Data Explorer. Uh, you could manually populate this, but it wouldn't be that much for us to be able to just pre-populate this with views out of uh, KMI to then go into Data Explorer to navigate, like how does how does your internet experience compare to what we're reporting here? Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's on the, on the slate, that's on the roadmap. So sales prospecting. Um, yeah, so this is a you know another use case. This is probably the original uh, use case for this type of capability was to say like, all right, I know my AS. I think I know my competitors' AS. Can I just get a keep tabs on who are their customers? And I want to know when they come and go. And I would like to keep tabs on my own customers and see when they uh, diversify away from me and get uh, uh, they took on a, another transit provider. That's not me, and they are under no obligation to tell me that. But I would like to know. Um, so there's there's lots of, uh, of uh, uh, data here that, that you can help uh, drive some sales planning. 
We don't have it in here just yet, but um, uh, another piece that's about to come out, remember this has just been a, out for a couple of months, is uh, adding dates to these things. So these relationships typically come into existence uh, on some day. And contracts for uh, uh, transit uh, are often in 12 month increments. So, you know, the, the, the idea is if you're coming up on the anniversary, maybe that if you didn't have any other uh, uh, timing to go off of, uh, that might be a good time to come with your your best uh, sale because uh, maybe they're negotiating. You don't know how, you know, unless you know how, how long their, uh, their contract's worth. So um, another thing is uh, identifying singly homed ASs. Um, it is possible uh, that there is a dormant link that's just not visible in BGP, but setting that, you know, stipulating that scenario aside, uh, there's also a use case where a, a salesperson could go in and say, hey, uh, AS, whatever, you are big enough now, because uh, we're sorting this by size, by address space, you're big enough now to not just have one transit provider, you should have two. Um, and uh, and I ought to be uh, your your second uh, option, and then you don't have to displace uh, someone existing. You can be augmented um, and eat a little away at uh, your competitor. That's uh, those are some of the uh, use cases. And then uh, I mentioned earlier a little anecdote about um, uh, you're getting alerted when uh, there's uh, changes for network planners or network architects, whatever role we want to um, uh, call it. Um, Nina, who's, who's actually a user of this uh, tool or, or something similar to it, um, uh, many uh, many years ago, and uh, uh, would use some, uh, a capability like this to try to take up a look at a market and figure out um, where uh, uh, what are the asses that you know Netflix, for example, when she was there, uh, that what are we missing uh, that we need to peer with? Uh, let's try to sort you know, uh, easily for someone who's not going to be pulling down route these data and F-grepping out uh, a bunch of stuff, just serve, serve this up in an easily consumable way and uh, help people out with their, uh, with their jobs. Let's see. And then, uh, yeah, the, my favorite thing that's about to come out is uh, maybe, maybe when uh, you're watching this video, this has already been uh, released. We have this going on the back end, but we call it insights, this news, like things that are happening. And on every, any given day, there are uh, changes happening. Uh, I get a, I get a, a feed of the, of the world because my scope is everywhere and I'm interested in everywhere. Uh, the way this will get used is that you would subscribe to markets that you care about, uh, networks and like ASs you care about that you'd like to know when they are gaining, losing transit providers, uh, customers, or things that are happening in a market. But I look at it all, uh, and when I saw this just a, a couple days ago, I was like, I was like, I've been watching uh, uh, Vietnam for a long time. And like some, there's some, you know, loss of something. I was like, half the time it's a submarine cable break because they have like a five or six at a year. There and, and I saw this come up on my uh, like a little internal email thing, and then sure enough, like later in that day, I was like, oh, you know, Vietnam uh, down you know, lost a submarine cable. Uh, got a little tip from that, but it's actually fascinating all of the stuff that's taking place. We just don't naturally have access to uh, a service that'll, that'll serve that up. And um, yeah, maybe I'll run through a little demo here. All right, so this is the landing page. If you log into Kentic, I'll just take you. How would you find this? We've got a link there marked with new. This is a new uh, service. So this is what it um, looks like. We'll have, have like a rolling, maybe like a rolling 12-month uh, look back uh, on um, uh, you know, the top ASs for whatever market. And there's a few different um, mechanisms for um, uh, flipping th uh, through different types of views. So obviously we have to separate V6 and V4. Uh, These are entirely different routing tables and for all intents and purposes kind of different internets uh, the relationships are different and so there's no way to intermingle uh, here so there's a, a v4 uh, there's a v6 uh, equivalent hurricane electric turns out they're doing pretty good in the v6 world um, so that's uh, v4 v6 uh, then where it gets kind of powerful here is uh, flipping around in uh, the geolocation and we'll, we'll Look at a couple examples of this, of the zero in on you know, different markets, and then um, uh, then there's this notion of uh, types of customer base. So one is just like straight customer cone, just the whole thing. And so anytime you look at that, you're going to end up with the big guys, like the the list that we have here. Uh, pick any country in the world, it ultimately rolls back to a lot of the the big uh, players, uh, just sometimes in different orders. 
uh, so then the uh, the concept here for like retail is to take all right and this is a uh, you know go with me on this this is uh to try we're trying to uh, uh, just pull out what are the as's at the the right most end of the as path who's originating address space uh and that's what we're calling retail so uh uh it doesn't necessarily mean you are a retail provider but this, this in the in the vernacular of this tool this is what this means so if i pull up uh something that might be recognizable in let's say let's take canada look at retail these are the networks that are originating canadian address space uh, you can also be retail if you are you get credit for retail if you were the single uh upstream of uh um, you're a sole sole upstream and then you get retail credit after that uh the next hops uh, wholesale and after that it's backbone um again it's a, they're a little fuzzy uh, uh how this ends up falling out uh, but um, in broad swaths, uh, ends up being helps you kind of zero in uh, roughly like what it is you want to uh, focus on. So right now we're looking at retail in Canada. Uh, these are uh, you know I think a good list. Um, uh, I was spending some time recently looking at this specifically around like say the Rogers uh, network, uh, having looked at their outage um, just uh, last month. And so yeah, so those views um, right. Here, here there's like a comparison against you versus the other as you're looking at right now we're configured for uh kentic which is uh 6169 not that interesting we, we're not a uh, service provider um let's see where they fall in rankings um again for oftentimes for marketing uh folks there's we are we have a few a couple of missed geo uh, uh prefixes that need to get fixed um but otherwise one thing that's super handy is this of like being able to pull up a, a, an AS in a country and figure out what are you what are we saying are its transit providers and customers, and so we're saying that they're buying from uh, Tata, Lumen, and then there's this one other Rogers AS that appears to be a transit provider, and uh, you know at first glance first glance when I saw this I was like oh maybe that's a uh, that's a mistake there's some uh, you know, funky thing that's going on here but this isn't a mistake in fact this is an interesting footnote to our analysis of the Rogers outage that this AS is a bridge to its competitors the Bell Canada Telus and this piece was the one thing that stayed up and was passing traffic when all the rest of Rogers Rogers was down but this uh, so ends up being even though this is another Rogers another part of Rogers. Rogers providing service to Rogers. Uh, there is some logic behind why this would appear in the uh, provider list. Otherwise, on the other side, this is who we are seeing as their AS level um, uh, customers. Obviously, not every customer has its own AS, and so this is just going to limit you to those that are, uh, you know, routing traffic. If you have an AS, you're routing traffic. Uh, we often will call this. These are the players in this market, and um, uh, people you may be able to get as a as a customer um we have rbc royal bank canada they've got you know, a handful of uh uh recognizable transit providers i also have prolexic for ddos defense because everybody needs something for ddos uh that ends up getting shown up they must have some always on uh stuff and so you know the, the logic is maybe you can go into the government of quebec if you were a competitor of rogers and say hey you know they just had this outage <laughs> if you want to go that route uh um and uh, maybe you should have more than one uh, transit provider. Um, someone's probably making this argument right now. Uh, and um, I don't know. I don't know. With the monopolistic layout of Canada, maybe that's not, uh, not everything's possible as far as making connections. But anyway, so that's how. Yeah, the, uh, the physics of service provider world, you know, even if you do have a second provider, theoretically, it's often running on the physical infrastructure of the first provider anyway. You could know. be, could be that. I guess, I, I mean, a, a competitor of Rogers may not be able to simply walk into Mordor and provide service. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I, all I can say is from the, um, from what you could glean out of uh, BGB data, and then you know a sales team would have to merge that with their own knowledge of the of the of the space. Yeah, the physics of the situation. <laughs> exactly. So I think that kind of covers. Uh, you know, the, like I said, the thing that's uh, we're looking to um, add that'll be out very soon is this notion of being able to have a, a user portfolio uh, and say like, here, here are the networks and markets they care about, uh, and now when you when we makes see some sort of change and every day there's changes uh or 
um, at least globally, maybe not in every market, uh, report these in some way to the uh, user so that they can uh, be stay informed. And I used to be a huge you know user of this kind of uh, thing, and I'm really happy to get this uh, uh, this thing going again. Um, uh, but anyway, so if there's any other questions, um, let me know. Um, one question I had is, could this work from the perspective of, you know, a customer customer of Kentech and you can make inferences of, you know, today's price per gigabit or megabit or transit cost versus the price of joining an IXP and say, hey, look, your flow, you're sending X flow over a trans provider Y. If you were to join DKIX New York at this price, uh, you would be saving X amount on transit costs. So. This tool does not have any price baked in, uh, but I, I think probably Avi would would love to answer your question of how you could do that with uh, the main product. However, there is a cost analytic system where you can there input you in all the gory detail. We don't yet have the, here's the buildings you should go to to save this money on that. And that's something that, you know, we have customers that are major data center and backbone providers. And, you know, it gets more complex when you factor in packet fabric and megaport and all the places you could get to. But that's definitely part of the planning. But.